All right, now, we're, uh, we're early in our study of the, the book of Romans, Paul's letter. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, from Corinth. He's writing, it's around A.D. 57, near the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And Paul is planning, he's going to deliver the collection to the saints in Jerusalem. And then after that, his plan is he's going to go to Spain. He's going to stop at Rome on the way, and then he hopes to head over to Spain with the support and the blessing and the interest of the Roman Christians. And I've mentioned to you before that you have both Jewish and Gentile Christians in the church there, and the Gentiles are probably in a substantial majority, which brings the church there within Paul's orbit. And so that's part of why I think how he, why he writes the way that he does. In chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, Paul gives this theologically rich greeting that we looked at some weeks ago that refers to the amazing gospel of God and Paul's role in relationship to that gospel. So we went through that in verses 1 through 7. And then in verses 8 through 15, Paul gives thanks for all the Roman Christians. He thanks God for them and he tells them he regularly prays for them, asking that God will provide him an open road to them. So he's letting them know that, look, I've long been praying that I could come to you. He says he longs to see them, that he might strengthen them. And he says, look, I don't want you to be unaware that I have often intended to visit you, but I've been hindered until now. So you're beginning to get this sense that somehow there's some kind of idea or objection to Paul's absence from Rome. Well, you know, we know the church has been there at least since 49, probably quite a bit earlier than that. Well, why has Paul never come to see us? He's been all over the Mediterranean, he's been there, but he's always stayed away from Rome. And you just, it just seems to me like Paul is sensitive to this, this idea, this concern, or he at least suspects it's a concern. Because as I say, he sits here and talks about he's been asking for an open road, he longs to see them, he often intended to visit them. And then in verses 14 and 15, he says he feels a sense of obligation to all the Gentiles, and for that reason, he's what? Eager to preach the gospel in Rome as he'd done in many other places. So now he says he's eager to preach. It's not like I'm avoiding you. It's not like I don't want to be there. I've been praying to get there. I often wanted to come see you. I've been hindered till now. I'm eager to preach there. And let's pick back up. And that, that's where we ended. I want to pick back up in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. On, I see. Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, both to the Jew first and to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is being revealed, a righteousness from faith to faith, just as it is written, but the righteous from faith shall live. As I say, Paul, he seems to me to have some idea that, that he, he believes that his absence from Rome, either he knows that it's an issue with the people, the Christians there in Rome, or he suspects it is, that some apparently saw his absence as an indication that he was ashamed of the gospel he preached. That's why Paul's not here. He's ashamed of the gospel he preached. Maybe they thought Paul was embarrassed to preach the gospel in such a sophisticated city as Rome. Rome is the heart of the empire. Rome is the grandest city, the best, the most elite. It has everything here, and Paul has never come here. So maybe they're thinking, look, Paul is, Paul is ashamed to preach it in this sophisticated city, as Paul noted in 1 Corinthians 1.23. Christ crucified is foolishness to Gentiles. Well, maybe that's what they're thinking. He's ashamed to preach this gospel in such a sophisticated city. It's foolishness to Gentiles, and he doesn't want to come here and preach it and defend it in this place. Martin Hengel, he's a German scholar, in his little book on the crucifixion, he expresses this idea of how outrageous 
the cross of Christ was in the Gentile world. He says, to believe that the one preexistent son of the one true God, the mediator at creation and the redeemer of the world, had appeared in very recent times in out-of-the-way Galilee as a member of the obscure people of the Jews, and even worse, had died the death of a common criminal on the cross could only be regarded as a sign of madness. The idea that this horrible criminal penalty would be imposed on one claimed to be the redeemer of the world and the agent of creation. And you can see, this is crazy. This is crazy. And so as Paul said, it's foolishness to Gentiles. And the resurrection, that's the, the rest of the crucifixion story. Right? We have the crucifixion, the idea that God the Son is, suffers this penalty. Not just executed, but he suffers the penalty that was the most shameful form of death a person could suffer in the ancient world. That's this idea in Hebrews about he bore the disgrace. Why? Because this was a horrible form of punishment that was reserved for the lowest criminals in the empire and here he's he's endured that but the resurrection which is the rest of the crucifixion story that was considered what absurd you know a lot of times in our society we you get the impression of you know those old ignorant people back then you know they didn't know that when somebody died they stayed dead they thought people popped up all the time so you just tell them oh yeah this guy rose from the dead and they go okay uh, uh, that happens that's not how it was they paid attention they knew that when you died, you stayed dead. And so the resurrection, the notion that a dead man came back to life was considered absolutely absurd in that world. And you see that for the philosophers in Athens, what they call Paul in, in Acts 17, 18. They call him a babbler. He's a babbler. And they sneered at him in 1732 of Acts for the resurrection. You see, now who are the, well, the philosophers? You know, they are the people who are really the intellectuals. They are the deep thinkers. And what are they? When they hear this talk about resurrection, they look at Paul like, you know, <laughs> what a joke. This guy is a nitwit. They sneer at him as being an intellectual nothing. And you think about Paul. You think how that how that would make Paul feel. Paul is, of course, somebody who's of great intellectual standing. He's schooled, what, at the feet of Gamaliel. One of the greatest rabbis there was. You see that in Acts 22.3. Galatians 1.14, what's Paul say? He was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his own age. Paul was an academic rock star. Paul was an intellectual. Festus tells him in Acts 26.24, your great learning is driving you insane. Your great learning. So Paul is an academic. He is an intellectual. And as a professor I once had, he said, God can use an educated man as well as an ignoramus. And Paul was an educated man, and Paul was somebody who's that way. And then to have these people in Athens and everywhere look and say, you're just a complete idiot. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think that would go down well. So the idea, maybe they're thinking, look, Paul doesn't want to come to Rome because Paul doesn't want to bring the gospel and defend it in such a sophisticated city in the heart of the empire. Maybe that's what they're thinking, or Paul suspects they may be thinking that. Or maybe they thought Paul was embarrassed to preach the gospel in a Christian community where there were elements that thought or suspected that the gospel that he presented was anti-law or anti-Jewish. You see, that would be a very difficult argument to make in light of the Old Covenant Scriptures. So maybe they thought Paul was unwilling to face close questioning on that because he wouldn't be able to make a coherent case because of their misunderstanding of how Paul's gospel hung together. But in any event, it seems that there is some suspicion or at least there is the concern of some possible suspicion 
that Paul's absence from Rome reflected some sense of shame or intellectual intimidation regarding the gospel. What, what does Paul say? Paul flatly declares he is not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of the gospel he preaches, and the reason he's not ashamed of the gospel, he says, whoever's thinking that, whatever level it is, I am not ashamed of the gospel I preach. That is absolutely crazy to think that, and I'm not ashamed of it. The reason is that the gospel he preaches, the true gospel, is that however it may appear to the world, the truth, the reality is that the gospel that he preaches is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, both to the Jew first and to the Greek, the Gentile. It is the power of God. However the world sees it, what is the reality of it? The reality is, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that because that gospel that I preach is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. God's saving power, His rescuing power is exercised through the message of His saving work in Christ. His saving power is exercised through that message. That message which was given by God is the seed through which humanity receives the new birth. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. The same Spirit of God writing through Peter. He says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, resulting in genuine brotherly love, love one another fervently, from a pure heart, having been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. How are they born? Through the living and enduring Word of God. He says, for all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was what? That was preached to you. Well, what is this word here? You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. Through the living and enduring word of God, this is the word that was preached to you. It is the seed of the new birth as was preached as good news to you. So that's what Paul is talking about. Paul says, I'm not at all ashamed of the gospel because this message of God's saving work in Christ is his means of saving all who believe. So what's to be ashamed of? This salvation, this salvation, however, it's only for those who believe. You see, it's only for those who believe. Here is this saving message, God's Work his power of God, the power of God at work in this message, but it is only for those who believe, for those who in both mind and will surrender themselves to Christ as he's presented in the gospel. See, saving faith, as I said two weeks ago, it is more, and I say many times, I don't know how many times I've said it. It is more than simply mental or intellectual assent, more than simply believing intellectually that certain things are true. You see, somebody can believe that and not surrender to it, not submit to that truth, not order their lives according to that truth. Saving faith is more than that. See, it includes believing the facts of God's work in Christ. Of course it includes that. It includes believing the facts, but it also includes surrendering to those facts. It includes this decision to live in accordance with that truth. As I say many times, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, if, if, in other words, if you're saying I'm Lord, why are you not acting that way? Anybody can say it. The question is, is it a reality? And that's what biblical faith is about. According to James chapter 2, 
Verses 14 to 26, see, faith that is mere mental assent, simply this intellectual belief in certain propositions, faith that only consists of mental assent is insufficient to receive salvation. It is insufficient. See, a faith that doesn't work, that does not manifest itself in a person's life, what does James say? It's a dead faith. It's a dead faith. It is simply intellectual understanding. If it doesn't manifest in your life, if it doesn't produce something that is the fruit of that submission, well, then it's a dead faith. It is not a living, biblical, saving faith. That's the point. When people say, well, James and Paul seem to be at odds. No, no, no. Paul speaks of a biblical saving faith. James is addressing this idea of mental assent. But somebody says, no, they just think these things are true. And we have people like that all over the place. Who say, oh, no, I believe that. And you look at how they live. They live in rebellion to God. And they think that because they say, I believe that fact is true, I'm good. But where do you get this idea? I don't see how anybody can read the Bible and get this idea. And so you have that, and James, James talks about that. And this is why Jesus told the parables of the tower builder and the king going to war in Luke 14, 28 to 33. You know, we often say at weddings that marriage is not to be entered into what lightly or unadvisedly. You hear that often at weddings. Why? Because it's a big, serious commitment, a lifelong commitment. And so we often say that there, well, in these parables, Jesus makes that point about Christian discipleship. Here's what Klein Snodgrass in his book on the parables, he says, discipleship changes allegiances with family. Yes? I'm telling you, you got family members don't like you if you're a Christian. They think you're self-righteous. They think you're, you know, whatever it is. But discipleship changes allegiances with family, requires the willingness to die, shifts the focus off self-centeredness, places one at the disposal of another, and changes the way one handles financial resources. Discipleship and becoming a Christian is a radical, life-changing commitment. It is not simply an intellectual exercise, and one has to weigh carefully whether one has the commitment or is willing to make the commitment to see it through. That's what Jesus says. He says, you're going to build a tower. Won't you first sit down to see, do I have the resources to complete the tower? And if you don't, you won't embark on it? Or will the king with 10,000, won't he first sit down and say, can I get through against the one coming against me with 20,000? He will weigh whether he has what he needs to complete it. And he's saying that in the context of people being disciples. And he says, listen, this call to discipleship is serious. It's not something like falling off a log. I I, I just kind of, no, it is a call. And you have to weigh, am I willing to give my heart, soul, life, and everything to Jesus Christ? Every person has to come to that point and be called and say, am I willing to surrender that? And a big part of the problem, in my judgment, is that we don't make that clear to people. No, 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 no. We don't want to be, that'll scare people off. If you say this kind of thing to people, people will be going, "Uh uh-oh, that's crazy. I can't do that. But that's what the Bible teaches. Christ calls us to come and die. And so if people understand, look, this is something. I can see you worrying about it. As I've told people, I said, look, being convinced of the truth is one thing. That gets you to the door of the plane. You then got to jump out. You've got to decide, will I take all that's involved in that? Will I take the loss of my job if it comes to that? Will I take everything that comes with my confessing Jesus Christ as Lord? That's what he's telling them, and that's what I'm saying here to you. You see this, this idea that salvation involves transformation or a surrender that inevitably produces change in a person's life. Okay, so Paul says it's for faith, but I want you to understand, when he says that, he does not mean this idea, I simply abstractly, intellectually, 
believes certain facts are true. He means that, but he means I yield to those facts. I order my life and submit to those facts, and that's very important. And as, I mean, it's an important thing in the religious world generally that people see and understand that. Now, since the, the, in the first century, faith in Christ inevitably was expressed in submission to baptism. You see this when we get to Romans chapter 6. This is how it was. You didn't have people up here say, hey, uh, not in the first century. I'm like, hey, you know, you don't need to be baptized in this kind of thing. That just wasn't part of the community of faith. Everybody understood that. And Paul's failure to mention baptism doesn't mean that baptism is not part of conversion. Because people will sit here and he says, look, he says this to everyone who believes. He doesn't say anything about baptism. He says everyone who believes. I know, I can read. (laughs) I can read. But you have to understand the context. In the first century world, everybody knew what came with that, you see? Everybody was simply understood that coming to faith included submitting to baptism. He doesn't have to say it. Because the people to whom he's writing had all been baptized and they all understood. Yes, that's what it means. When I come to faith, I express that and I call out to God in submission to baptism. They understood that. You know, and we understand it. If one said that being present, president, that being president is for whoever wins elections, if somebody said that, that person wouldn't mean that a person could serve as president without being sworn into office. It wouldn't mean that, you see. It's just understood and assumed that those who win elections are sworn into office. So you you see how this works. I don't have to say that all the time. If somebody said that, you say, okay, yeah, I understand that. You say, he didn't say you can be president without being sworn. He didn't mean that. Because he's speaking in a context where everybody understood that winning the election was followed, you see, inevitably, always. That's how it works. So that's just a footnote, and I'll say more about that when we get to Romans 6. Now, though salvation is by faith in Christ for both Jew and Gentile, There's a sense in which the Jew has priority over the Gentile. That's why he says to the Jew first. See, to the Jew first. There's a sense in which the Jew has priority over the Gentile. God chose the Jews as the people. The people through whom Christ was brought into the world, right? He's the seed of Abraham. He's the one who's going to be through you what all the nations of the world will be blessed. That's the line through which God chose to bless the world by bringing Jesus through that line. So there's this sense of the priority here. Jesus was brought into the world through the Jewish lineage, so it's not surprising that the gospel was promised in advance to Jews through the prophets. Chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. And that they were the first to have the gospel preached to them by Jesus and the apostles. So he says, to the Jew first, And to the Gentiles. You see, so there is this sense of Jewish priority. Now, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. He says, for in it, the righteousness of God is being revealed. It's the power of God for salvation. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed is being manifested. See, when righteousness is attributed to God in the Old Testament, it very often has reference to his saving activity. You see, it often has reference to his saving activity. That is the form his righteousness takes. You see in Isaiah 46, 13 as an example, I bring near my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. He says in Psalm 98 too, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. And you see other texts that I put down here that carry that same sense. That righteousness of God often carries this idea that it, that it is God's saving work. His rescuing work, his saving activity, that is the expression of God's righteousness. 
And I think that's what Paul is getting at right here. See, in the preaching of the gospel, in the in preaching of the gospel, God's saving action is occurring. It's taking place. It is being revealed in history in the sense it is being manifested. It is occurring. So it's taking place in history through the preaching of the gospel. His righteousness in the form of his rescuing or saving work is taking place in history in the preaching of the gospel. God is rescuing and saving people. In other words, the righteousness of God You see, it's taking place in history, and it's through, he righteous as he works, his saving action is taking place, and the way it takes place is through his bestowing of a righteous status on those who believe. So God, in the preaching of the gospel, when people believe it, he is actively saving them. His righteousness is being revealed in, that is his rescuing work. And how is he saving them? He is saving them by giving them righteousness. You see, he's saving them by bestowing a righteous status on them. In other words, the righteousness of God here, in my view, it includes both God's activity, his making right, his rescuing, his work of saving, his vindicating, and it includes the status of those who are made right. So his rescuing work, his saving activity through the gospel involves his making people righteous on the basis of the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ. This saving work of righteousing people. Can I use that word? Righteousing people? See, his his work and his activity of saving people is by his righteousing them. That's how he does it. That's what he's doing. And this saving work of kissing people is, of course, based on what? The atoning death of Jesus Christ, which is what? The heart of the gospel. See, that's, that's what it is. So Paul says, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in the gospel, the power of God for salvation is being revealed. For in it, the righteousness of God is at work. This rescuing effort, this rescuing work of God, and this saving work of God, this rescuing bestowal of righteousness, this saving work of God, this rescuing bestowal of righteousness is what? He says, from faith to faith. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about what does that mean. You see, does it mean that it's all totally, completely faith? It seems to have some idea of a direction, some idea of an expansion or an extension. And I think he means it's from faith to faith in that it it expands with the spreading of faith. It tracks the expansion of faith because faith is what? The means of God's saving work. So it's like God's rescuing activity, His righteousness which is done by his righteousing people through faith, their trust in the gospel, it expands and it tracks faith. It is from faith to faith as it grows in the world. And so I think that's what he's talking about, this righteousness here. He sits here and he says, the righteousness of God, the saving work of God, that it is from faith to faith. I think that's what he is. Now, nobody earns salvation. I get tired of hearing people say that about Church of Christ, you're legalistic. I don't like it. Because legalism is a serious error. You see, legalism and the idea that I somehow gain and earn my standing before God based on my performance is crazy. You see, it it requires just the least bit of introspection into who you are, into your own heart, your own selfishness, your own pride, just take a look. You see, and you'll understand that you're not standing before a holy God. You're not standing before a holy God. And so this idea, you know, I I don't doubt that in every group that takes the Bible seriously, you have people that lapse into that. Okay? I, I know that. You know, I'm not naive. But I'm telling you, theologically, it is absurd. Okay, nobody earns their standing before God. 
It is a gift given to them, and that's what Paul is talking about here. You see this idea that this, from faith to faith, God's rescuing work of his righteous people is a gift that is given to people in faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, it points out that the righteous are characterized by faith. You see, Habakkuk 2, 4, he says, the righteous shall live by faith. Those who are righteous will manifest faithfulness. They will live faithfully. The righteous shall live by faith. And Paul's inspired application of that text, Paul develops the point from Habakkuk, making clear that that faith not only characterizes the the righteous, it's not only how they live, it is also the basis of their righteousness. The means of their righteousness. Faith is the means by which they become righteous by the grace of God. Paul says, the righteous from faith shall live. There is no other righteousness. There is righteousness. Well, I'd have to actually amend that because there is a practical righteousness that you can see that's referred to people. You see, it doesn't mean absolute righteousness. But in the righteousness we're talking about, in the standing of God, the complete, perfect righteousness, that is only given to people. You don't earn it. You can't. It is given to people through faith. So Paul is sitting and saying, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'll preach the gospel anywhere, anytime, anybody, any place, because I know the truth of what it is. And we have to be that way. Because our world tries to intimidate us about the gospel of Christ and say, oh, you believe that? You believe some dead guy? Oh, <laughs> what a joke. I believe it. It's the power of God for salvation. And you'll be mocked and scorned and all that stuff. But you're not ashamed of it because you know what it is. So you preach it. You tell it. You say it. This is what it is. And you let, it, you let those chips fall. But you're going to be... Uh, you know, attacked as Paul was and all that. Now, here's an outline. I mentioned this before. I know it's like an eye test. I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it any uh, bigger and still have enough on there that I wanted you to see. But uh, just to tell you where we're going. You see, at least the way I look at this, from you have this 118 to 320. Paul's going to make the case for the universal reign of sin. You see, and where we're going to jump and look to next is that all persons are accountable. He's focusing on Gentiles. He doesn't call them out and specify, but it's pretty clear he's talking about Gentiles. And then we'll go here in 2, in two 1 through 3, 8. Jews are accountable to God for sin. Then we get down to 9, 3, 9 to 20. You have the guilt of all humanity. So first, Paul is going to establish the universal reign of sin because that's the problem, right? That's the problem. And so there is a need. There is a need, and Paul lays it out for them to show them that, this, uh, that he's going to present the gospel. Now, I'm looking up at that clock, and I see that, uh, well, it's just the way it always goes. All right, one eight, chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what is noble of God is evident among them. For God displayed it to them. For his invisible attributes are clearly seen since the creation of the world, includes the cosmos, being understood by the things made, both his eternal power and deity, so that they are without excuse. Because having known God, They did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings and their uncomprehending hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for a likeness of an image of mortal man and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. So Paul says here, look, God's saving work that Paul has just been talking about. God's saving work, his righteousing of people through faith is taking place in the preaching of the gospel. That saving work is so important, is of supreme importance because, 
You see, he says four, which for some reason the NIV leaves off. But his work of righteous people, that saving work, is so important because the terrible wrath of God that ultimately is coming is already being previewed. It's already being previewed in his wrath upon the ungodliness and unrighteousness of human beings. That wrath is already being previewed in his wrath upon ungodliness and unrighteousness of human beings. Now, God's wrath is different from human anger. When we talk about, there's another one of these things that we say, I don't want to talk about God's wrath because it makes God seem mean. Well, I don't know what you do with the Bible. You know, we got to get out of this stuff. We have to stop letting the world condition how we speak and what we say. That's all a ploy, do you see, to change the message. It's all a maneuver by the world and the enemy to get you to distort the message so you will comply with what I find fitting. Our function is to present the truth of God. That's our function. And so Paul sits here and he says, look, this righteousness is taking God. There's this wrath that is being revealed. It is different from human anger. John Stott says in his commentary, he says, it does not mean that he loses his temper flies into a rage or is ever malicious, spiteful, or vindictive. His wrath is his holy hostility to evil. His refusal to condone it or come to terms with it, his just judgment upon it. It's not a little, you know, a a hissy fit. That's not what it is at all. C.E.B. Cranfield in his commentary says, A man who knows, for example, about the far-reaching injustice and cruelty of apartheid and is not angry at such wickedness is not a good man. By his lack of anger, he shows his lack of love. God would not be the truly loving God that he is if he did not react to our, our evil with wrath. And you see, that's the idea. If you can yawn, at evil and wickedness and injustice, that's not to your credit. And we think that it is in our society. Oh, who am I to judge? What do you mean, who are you to judge? If there's rampant evil, somebody's raping a child, you, well, well, you know, well, that's not my thing. But, you know, that's okay. Do you think that's noble? That's not noble. Not at all. And God is absolutely holy and his wrath is directed toward evil. Now Paul makes the point that the wrath of God against sinners, both as previewed in history and as completed on judgment day, he says it is just. The wrath of God is just. Paul makes the point it's just because he has revealed himself to all mankind through creation. His wrath is just because God has displayed himself in his creation. Creation bears witness to God. And what what has mankind done? Creation bears witness to God, but mankind, what? Willfully suppresses that testimony. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see that. I want to come up with alternatives that will allow me to deny it. I don't want to be responsible. So Paul says that mankind suppresses that testimony, preferring to go its own foolish way and to create its own gods. It doesn't like the message that there is this awesome, powerful, holy God. And this is an intuitive thing. You see, it's kind of like what you know from about a composer from music. It is built in and people can feel it and see it and it's intuitive. They have to suppress it. And this is what winds up, they wind up doing. And rather than embrace the testimony of, from creation about God, they wind up you know, suppressing it instead of embracing it and giving God the glory He is due. Look, isn't he due glory? Who does this? God says, creation. Who does that? All we ought to do is just fall on our faces. 
But rather than do that, they suppress that testimony, don't give God his due, and humanity then it it culpably represses the truth and it substitutes gods of its own making. I want to have a God that I can create, I can control, I can do this kind of thing. I do not want to submit to the God who created all things. Now that's what Paul is saying. I don't believe that. I'm telling you what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is saying, that mankind is done. Mankind has this testimony before it, but sticks its head in the sand and says, I don't want the testimony. Let me create a little image of a reptile. Oh, we can do that. I don't want this. I don't want this, because this is something that controls me and has all that I am. This thing I'm a little more comfortable with. Reminds me of that line from McGuigan about you know, Jesus on a dashboard. I'll have $3 worth of God, please. Having him as a little bobble thing on a dashboard. If you have that, I'm not after you. I didn't see it in the parking lot. I'm just saying. Okay. So, I mean, you just see this, you, this, this idea that they wind up suppressing this. They suppress, you know, this, and they don't give God his glory And they create this thing. Now, I think Paul's focusing, as I said, on the idolatry of the Gentile world. He doesn't come out and say, look, right here I'm after Gentiles. I want them. But when you see him talking so much about idolatry, he's focusing on the Gentile world that had a multitude of images, right? That's what he talks about here when he says, the likeness of an image of mortal man and birds and animals. They had all kinds of images that represented a contact point with the gods they had created. You see, this was kind of like, you know, something like a voodoo doll. You see, that was, the, that was the embodiment of the God, and I could contact the God through this image. That's not the God. It is the representation of the God, but that's how I interact with the God. And so they had all kinds of things like that. And he says, they didn't give the Creator who is proclaiming His glory to them in His creation. They rejected that. You think, I, that bell's getting softer. I'm going deaf. All right, I heard that bell. Uh, next week, Lord willing. Thank you.